uh, 10 years of negotiating my way through the Mormon Church's um, torturous program for reorienting or uh, curing uh, homosexuals, turning, turning us, trying to, tur trying to turn us into heterosexuals. In Spencer Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, he states that masturbation leads to homosexuality. They would place a heparin lock in my wrist, um, and then they could hook an IV up to that and I would be placed in a room alone and with a plethysmograph on my penis that would measure um, physical arousal. So when I started to get an erection, they would know. Then they would start to show me gay pornography. I'd never seen sex before at all. And using the IV and the heparin lock would inject an emetic drug into my system and I would start vomiting while watching the gay pornography. And then they would switch it over to heterosexual pornography and uh, inject a euphoric drug into me so that I would associate a feeling of euphoria with heterosexuality. I look back on that and I think if they had offered me electric shock therapy I would have done that. But um, I, I'm extremely um, phobic around vomiting. I think for Mormonism, this is going to be the most difficult issue that they're ever going to face, seriously. They, they have painted themselves into a theological corner. In complete secrecy and desperation, I enlisted the help of the BYU Psychology Clinic and eventually enrolled in a program of electric aversion therapy under the direction of graduate student Max Ford McBride and supervised according to the requirements of Utah law by Dr. Eugene Thorne, a licensed psychologist and BYU faculty member. This therapy is described in McBride's, in McBride's dissertation Use of Visual Stimuli in Electric Aversion Therapy, BYU, 1976. In the summer of 1975, I finished my therapy. In the, in the early 80s, I began to hear rumblings from Provo regarding denials of aversion therapy having happened at all. A reporter from a newspaper in Spokane, in pursuit of the story of aversion therapy at BYU, had been flatly told by administration officials that aversion therapy never happened, that it was a, quote, fabrication of the enemies of the church. I immediately sent him a copy of the dissertation, which documented the therapy, and within minutes of him presenting the copy of the dissertation, those same officials who denied that it ever happened came clean, claim, claiming, some, claiming some sort of misunderstanding. I was incensed that they would lie. It was only that episode, it was, and it was that episode that cemented my resolve to document what had happened. My essay is now a matter of public record. As late as 1997, BYU professor Merrill J. Bateman was, quote, unable to verify that electric perversion therapy had taken place. At this juncture in my life, I was convinced that the church would lie, would and did lie, as it had lied about the facts of my aversion therapy. It had lied publicly and often, and I do not accept the caveat that BYU is not the Mormon Church. It lied institutionally on and off for over 20 years about aversion therapy, and BYU is owned and completely, and completely under the directorship of the leading authorities of the church. To suggest otherwise is quite simply nonsense. The therapy, as we referred to it, then in the basement of the Smith Family Living Center on the BYU campus. It was like BYU security would catch would catch people like in in uh, compromising positions or whatever, and they had the choice of either um, uh, being kicked out of school and their families called and informed about what they had done 
or they could undergo this therapy. And so um, we had quite a few people who were going through it. And then there were other people who felt like so much guilt over their sexuality or had been promised that they, if they went, underwent this therapy that, that um, they'd be able to marry and have children and they would just be turned away. Of course, they had to have the desire to change. Therefore, if the therapy failed, then it was always their fault because they didn't have enough desire to change. They would come in, usually three times a week. Um, I would be behind a, a, um, a glassed one-way mirror, quite a large mirror. I'd be sitting behind there, and, um, and they would be on the other side of that. And they, we would, um, they had the choice they could look at um, pornographic magazines, or um, we would show videos up on the wall. And we would uh, tape um, electrodes uh, to their groin and uh, about three or four inches down from that on their thigh. Then we would also uh, tape up on their chest. And then we had another machine that would um, monitor their, um, their breathing and their heart rate. We had a dial that we turned and that would uh, determine the amount of current that would, would go into the shock. And, and we would wait until we, we saw that, that they, were, that they were getting aroused, and then we would, would push a button and, the, and the, the voltage would go into the wire. And from the reaction that I saw them and also the muscle spasms that went on, um, I'm, I'm sure that it was painful. And then after we did that, then we would, then we would, um, the movies would automatically switch over and we would show um, uh, a man and a woman um, having sex and, and we would pay, uh, play very soothing music in the background to try and get the, the, the mind to relate to that. When we got into the higher voltage with the people who had been doing it longer, you could see uh, burn marks on the skin and quite often um, you could, they would also um, throw up uh, during the therapy. After undergoing that kind of pain over a period of a couple of months, anybody would um, say, would admit uh, that, that they had, had completely changed. What they did was they kept records for as long as the people were at BYU. And then after they left BYU, there was no records kept to see what kind of, of, um, of su success rate they had had. And so, and, uh, and, and the, statistics from just the BYU, I mean, these people were lying. They were, I mean, they were desperate to get their degree and to get out of that situation. They had been blackmailed into that situation in the first place. But no, we never changed anyone from gay to straight. We had several people who committed suicide do during the therapy. We had um, um, three different people who hung themselves in the Harris Fine Arts Center from the balcony. If you die of a suicide, I mean, you're going to be punished eternally anyway. And if you die while you're still homosexual, you're going to be punished eternally anyway. And what God says to Mormons regarding fixing homosexuals led to a suicide epidemic on the campus of Mormon-owned Brigham Young University. I was getting ready for work one day and I got a telephone call and it was someone that identified themselves as a detective. And they said, uh, your name is on a list of 12 people that has been turned in for being a homosexual. And they sent me to a man on campus. At one point they had me there for more than 12 hours and they gave me syrup of Ipecac, which is a charcoal drink that is given to people who have overdosed and it causes them to throw up. And so about the time I was throwing up, um, that's when I started hearing the name calling. Well, you're just a fucking oh, cocksucker. I was horrified. There was a chair and an empty room and me. And that time they made me take my clothes off. The last appointment that I went to was the worst. They put electrodes on me, on my wrists, and on a strap on my chest and on my genitals. I was given a button that I was told to push if I saw something that I felt was sinful and wrong or if I liked it. 
At this point, it was only naked men. I was told if I didn't push the button strongly enough that they would push it for me. And I don't recall how long that went on, but I was told to get dressed and leave. A good friend, he's gone, he's passed away now, allowed them to do it all. They attached the electrodes to his testicles and gave him a button, and he didn't push it hard enough, and they shocked him over and over and over. It absolutely, totally made him sexually dysfunctional. It, it completely destroyed him. Of the list of 12, two of them killed themselves that day. Two of them disappeared. Almost everybody on that list tried to commit suicide. I overdosed on pills, and the bishop was at the emergency room with me when I came around, and he said, he was very angry with me, and he said, if you would have been successful, you would have been the 30th suicide this semester. But Bruce survived becoming a nurse at a mental hospital near BYU, where he says he met young, gay, Mormon men condemned. I chose a few of them to do my case studies on. And I found that the only thing that they had in common is that they were all charged with homosexual crimes, crime against nature. There were some of them that the doctors convinced the families, and the families convinced the young men to have frontal lobotomies. The frontal portion of your brain is where your emotions, your attractions are considered to be. The most common is to go with a long needle through the eye socket. Uh, sometimes they will go through the, through the temporal area. As I understand it, it would just be damaging part of the brain. I've always been surprised that others have not told their story. But I know why they don't. Recounting sometimes is as painful or more so than going through it. So. Bruce R. McConkie, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, made a statement several years ago to the youth of the church that it would be better to be dead than to be homosexual. The state of Utah today has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. It's higher than any other state, higher than most countries. A disproportionately large number uh, of these suicides are young, gay, Latter-day Saints who simply felt that there was so much pressure on them that they felt that taking their own life uh, was the best alternative.